Well, uh, Marie-Laure, that was one of the most generous, beautiful. I, I just wanted to keep on sitting there and listening to you. Uh, I was enjoying it a lot. Uh, but uh, I have to work a bit. I must say that I've been in Singapore for two days, and I've been talking, 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 talking. So uh, yeah, it's been a lot of talking, but it's been really interesting. I have the sense that Singapore is going through a very particular one of these yet another phase of partial unsettlement, which means also partial openings for new elements, if you want. So it's been really quite, quite uh, surprisingly fascinating, I must say. Now, what I, I brought two books for the, I don't know, for the library of the institute, etc. I want to thank Marie-Laure, Arjit, Matthias Thiemann, he just left. Tell him that I mentioned him. Uh, there he is, very good. Thank you very much for everything, and it's a pleasure to meet you, and it's great to see some of you. Um, what I want to talk about is um, research that I'm doing right now, and um, the, the name is, it's a little book that I call Expulsions, uh, and the inevitable subtitle is When Complexity Produces Elementary Brutalities. That's what I'm going to talk about. So it's not a particularly beautiful story, but it is a piece of reality out there. I do not have a conclusion. I am trying to capture processes that are going on right now, and they keep mutating. Um, and I, I, um, I mean, the, the, basic, the basic framing proposition is that at some point when you have more inequality, more homelessness, more destruction of the biosphere, more displaced people in the global south, more land grabs, which in turn evict people from the smallholder agriculture sector. In other words, processes happening in the global north and in the... Is there a problem? Okay. That was the problem? If all problems could be solved so easily, that would be great. Uh, can I keep on talking? Yes. Okay, very good. So at some point, we need new conceptual categories to name it. To simply say more inequality, more poverty is not enough. So I am throwing myself out there in the lion's den, so to speak. And I'm arguing that what we're really looking at is a, is a new systematicity. And it's partial. It's an organizing logic, if you want. And so I call it expulsions. And... Um, and, and here, is a, here is sort of a, uh, an added element. I think that today we're living in an epoch where there are sort of conceptually speaking subterranean trends, dynamics, and I repeat, conceptually speaking they're subterranean. It doesn't mean that they're happening beneath the ground. Huh? Um, that are cutting across a lot of the familiar divisions through which we give meaning to certain manifestations. So if something happens in China, we tend to think, aha, that is China. If it happens in France, in the United States. And so they cut across when they pop up, when they manifest empirically, often in thick realities. The categories of meaning that we trot out to understand what is happening are our current categories of meaning. And so I'm arguing that actually there, it is quite possible that we're dealing with trends that are cutting across north-south divides, east-west divides, and all kinds of other divides within that framing. That, and, and, and that part of this global gets constituted that way. When they come to the surface, they, they acquire very thick and localized shapes, which then confuse us easily. But actually, it is. These are very, very broad trends. Now, we can think of a very simple example. The, the Occupy movements, you know, the, the, basically the protests by the sons and daughters of middle classes, that's how it started, Los Indignados in Spain, the Occupy movement in the United States, Tahir uh, uh, in Cairo, the, the, the movements that were happening in Chile, you know, there, there, there was a lot of this. And, and each one of these movements belongs to a specific history and genealogy, specific markers, and yet, in some ways also, they are all a response to something that has changed 
in the current type of economic system that we have. So that these middle class young people who have studied, they've done their deal. In other words, sort of in the West, we would say the contract with a with a, so, with a liberal state. They have fulfilled it. And then they arrive and there are no jobs. There's nothing for them, you know, exaggerating a bit. And so that is just one example. So I'm not saying that it's a homogenizing or a standardizing. Deep genealogies, deep histories, and at some point, they begin to intersect with broader dynamics. Those broader dynamics are really conceptually invisible to us. We do not see them with our current categories. And so in that sense, subterranean. Now, to do what I do, I have to suspend method. Method, if you're a social scientist, is a disciplining. And disciplining means you have to, all kinds of things that you would like to do, you cannot do. And so I call this, let's see how this works here, before method. Now, I'm playing off on a famous little book called After Method. I don't know if some recognize that. But, and, and, and there are sort of analytic tactics. And what I mean by that is the freedom, I take the freedom, to position myself vis-a-vis -vis the object of study the way I want. Not disciplined by method, but disciplined by the need to discover, by the hard work of trying to detect what is going on. And, and so one, one, can you see, I see it all gray. Can you see the letters actually? Oh, very good. Good, because I can see it here. So the, the first point here is an emphasis on the making of, the making of inequality, the making of justice. Now, making is a partial uh, categorization, but that's what I want. I want to emphasize that it was made. And that means, you know, that a certain set of issues come into play and others don't. And I repeat, making is partial because there are also there genealogies. You know, it's much more than just the act of making. But what I want to recover is the various material practices, uh, practices of meaning, etc., that make something. And I include here ephemeral conditions like inequality, justice, not just, you know, very, very practical things. Now, secondly... The, the, the points that you see are destabilizing stable meanings. No meaning, no complex meaning is forever stable. But I think that meanings acquire a certain kind of stability. I find in this current period that it becomes important to actively destabilize stabilized meanings. What does economy mean today? State, liberal state. You know, so so it, it's actually an active destabilizing of meanings. And, and um, um, the second one, in the shadows of powerful explanations. So confronted with a very powerful explanation, my first move, and you know, I, I sort of have understood that I do this without even thinking about it, but now I have, now I'm naming it. My first reaction is to ask, what is it hiding precisely because it is so powerful? And, and again, I will, I will elaborate on this, you know, in, in, in more detail. The third one, when territory exits conventional framings, I don't think I'm going to get to that. But here the notion is, I'm, work that I'm doing is to recover the category territory. I think we have sort of um, uh, lost a sense of the significance of this category. Did I hear you mention something about territory also, right? And so I, I think of territory as a complex capability. It's not land, it's not ground, it's not terrain. Um, and it's not working analytically for us today. Why? Because we have subsumed it under one meaning, the meaning of the national sovereign state. So it's sort of sitting pretty and not working. So I'm very interested in recovering and, and so in, in this project that you mentioned, you know, which I'm now calling ungoverned territories, I'm really trying to make territory work analytically. Now I might touch on that part today if there is time, maybe in the questions or 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 when I talk about land grabs, but you know, it's a whole thing onto itself. But it really matters to many of the things that I'm saying. And uh, 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 and, and one element that I developed in my territory book is this notion that in order to understand the current condition, we cannot simply talk about the national and the global. 
We've got to find more foundational elements that allow us to see something that we don't see if we just keep this binary. So I, you know, I, I talked about a variety of ways in which territory, authority, and rights get assembled into particular formations. So the global city could be thought of as one of those formations. Now, <coughs> let me illustrate. So I'm going to use one example that is you know, of some interest, perhaps, since there seems to be quite a debate here about immigration, so I thought I would bring that in. But so this notion of destabilizing you know, significant categories, you can think master categories. And I would argue that, that when we say immigration, we are making a categorical out of it. You know? And it's as if we just say the word and we don't have to think about it because it says everything. And when I do my own research about immigration, I, I never, I, I suspend the term out, out of my conceptual apparatus in order to really see something. Now, so again, as an exercise now, what does the powerful category immigration keep us from seeing about immigration? And so in some ways we could talk here about conceptual expulsions. And, and so what I like to do, for instance, is not to focus on the, on the subject, but to focus on immigration spaces. And these will vary in different societies at different times. These are made. And they are made through law, through practices, through ideologies, etc. And so you get, you know, I'm just listing a few. I, I hope that you, I can really not read that screen, but you can see it, right? So each one of these is quite different. Now, what am I getting at here? What does it mean for me to destabilize the immigrant subject? So one element is that there are actually a whole variety of different types of immigrant subjects, and some of them we don't even call immigrants. But secondly, that a given person cannot be flattened into the particular immigration space she is in. And so some of these immigrants, we all know, I mean, we have worked on immigration, we know that they, may, they maybe have a doctorate, but the first job is parking lot attendant, but their subjectivity cannot be flattened into that immigration space or into that job. And in fact, they can move, they can move across these spaces, and many people do. I like to say that my first job in the United States, now I was an adventurer, huh? I arrived with $50 in my pocket, I was an undocumented immigrant, I, they believed me, I guess, that I was a tourist or whatever, and I was a cleaning woman. Did I think myself a cleaning woman? Did the other, I was mostly with African, uh, African Caribbean and, and uh, Latin American. None of us thought that we were simply a cleaning woman. That was the space in which we were, but that you know, had nothing to do with what we felt, and none of those women, women stayed in that. So now I'm just using this as an illustration to destabilize a category. <coughs> now let me start with what I want to talk about, which are these kinds of expulsions. Now when I, I wish I had a blank slide right here because I need a blank slide, but I don't have one, a black slide. But when I talk about expulsions, I'm talking about something that happens at a systemic edge. It does not happen at the geographic border. I don't know how that works with your geography, the return of geography. So the systemic edge can be right there on Wall Street, downtown London. The systemic edge is not a marginal space. And there are multiple systemic edges. So, so when I talk about expulsions, it is something that happens at the systemic edge. And just to, give you, just to give you a bit of background, I would argue that in the West, if you, if you take the period after World War II, you know, the Keynesian years, so to say, and if you position yourself at the systemic edge, if your point of inquiry is the systemic edge, what you see is that the system brings in people as consumers, and as workers, not because it is a nice system. There were inequalities, discrimination, injustices, but that is the systematicity. In other words, it brings in mass consumption, mass production, mass building of suburban housing. You're bringing in people as workers and as consumers. Today, beginning in the 1980s in many of our countries, and certainly now very acutely in some of the European countries, if you position yourself at the systemic edge, what you see is that the system expels people. Not because it is meaner than others than the prior system, but that is the systematicity. 
And so that is a bit what I'm playing about. So when, when, when the European Central Bank, as it recently did, says, ah, Greece is on its way to recovery. We're going to upgrade its credit rating. You remember that that happened? It has created a protected but shrunken space of the economy. That possibility of recovering a bit lies on the, sh on, on the shoulders of 25%, 30% of the workers that have been thrown out and families thrown out of homes, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing a bit in the United States and in other countries. So, so uh, this systemic edge is, I think, a very important uh, item in understanding what is different today. And that, in fact, you can have the recovery of a Greek and a Spanish economy, et cetera, but really a shrunken space, as opposed to the Keynesian period, when it kept bringing in, it kept expanding, you know, uh, uh, the incorporation of people. Now, let me now move to this, this question of in the shadow of, uh, of powerful categories. So when we say urbanization, and you must all have heard politicians who say half of the people in the world live in cities. Now, I can't hear that anymore, that phrase. It just makes me ill. Because it's almost an act I find, I'm sorry, I hope I don't offend anybody of, of ignorance. And so what the story is for me is today when we talk about urbanization, we have got to bring in a much wider zone of activity. And so in that sense, in the shadow of urbanization. So it comes back to that analytic tactics that I was talking about at the beginning that confronted with a very powerful category like urbanization, I immediately need to know what is it hiding precisely because it is so powerful. Now, one set of processes that is feeding urbanization is a profoundly rural process, which is land grabs. You know, land grabs is one way of putting it. I'm sure that some of you maybe don't feel so comfortable. We can say <coughs> what we're really talking about is acquisition of land by foreign governments and by foreign firms. That is a bit the, but you know, in fact, there is a lot of non-foreign acquisition as well. I hope I'm communicating here. So this is a process that has existed for hundreds of years. This is not new. So it bobs on and on. I, as a social scientist, what I really care about is when the curve changes direction or angle. So what you see happening in this recent period, in 2006, the curve of land acquisitions goes like that, up. So it had, it's not new. Huh? It's been happening, happening, but then poof, it goes up like that. Between 2006 and 2011, 220 million hectares of land were bought by foreign, again, governments, well, acquired in some cases, eh, long-term leases, et cetera, by foreign governments and by foreign firms in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, in Russia, Ukraine, you know, even a bit in Europe, even a bit in the United States. So the United States passed a law at some point saying no more land buying when they started to buy land in the Midwest, you know, our heartland, as they say, no more land buying. But so, so the question then is, is something happening that this curve goes up? I don't need to go into a sort of a deep explanation of, of what is the mix of elements. But clearly, if you consider, and I think I have some, some, uh, some figures here, uh, if you consider that in 2011, the main buyers of land in sub-Saharan Africa were hedge funds. Then you begin to see, well, something is happening here. The, the specificity of the current moment kicks in. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, they all also bought land. So buying land means when, when financial firms enter the picture and buy land, you're talking about the liquefying of land. Land becomes liquid. It exits whatever, you know, the sort of national territoriality bit. It becomes something else. It actually becomes nomadic, institutionally nomadic. It switches institutional zones. And um, now the other issue here that matters is what happens when China buys 2.8 million hectares in Zambia, 208, whatever, 2.5 million in Congo to make a plantation of palm for biofuels. It evicts floras 
faunas, smallholder agriculture, villages, rural manufacturing districts. So what has happened? The complexly articulated territory, you know, all those smallholder agriculture, the rural manufacturing, and they articulate, they make territory, if you want. It becomes land. And, and I have a whole bit on that, you know, are we seeing the, the making of new informal jurisdictions here? What does it mean that you have very powerful buyers? And mind you, I mentioned China, because everybody knows that China is doing this, but Sweden, South Korea, all kinds of countries are doing this. So it's not just China. So, of course, what this also means is that all kinds of people are thrown off. And where do they go? They go to cities, a lot of them. They don't go necessarily all to the mega cities, as some people seem to think. They go often to small cities. But for me, today, when we talk about urbanization, we've got to bring this in. So that means in the shadow huh, of these very powerful um, explanations. Now here, I'm looking at 93 contracts. And, and um, as I said at the beginning, you know, one of the propositions that organizes this research for me is this notion that we are producing enormously complex instruments to generate elementary uh, brutalities, uh, this complexity and brutality, and sort of elementary brutalities. So I'm looking at these, con and these are just, you know, what, what I'm showing here are just a few, looking at 93 contracts. And each of these contracts is an enormously complicated, you know, set of this and that, because for a foreign country, for a foreign government to buy land is not so easy. So some people say, you know, it's an old story, commodification, etc. Sure. But it is also true that now that you have an interstate system and national state jurisdictions and all of that, it actually, you have a whole superstructure of inventing mechanisms that allow South Korea or Sweden or China or whatever, France, etc., to buy land in another sovereign country, even if that sovereignty is more formal than real. Um, I, I'm hoping that I'm communicating here. And so again, each of these, and I'm, these are just casual things that I'm throw down, but each of these has a contract that is really quite interesting. Mm. Did I just send it up? Now, so, so here is this notion you know, that I was talking about a plantation. So you go from national territory to plantation. In other words, part of the story that I'm telling of, that I'm talking about is the making of structural holes in the tissue of national sovereign territory. So a very, very complex, if you want, process. And it becomes a more elementary condition. Territory is a complex condition. When it becomes a plantation, it becomes more elementary. Uh, here are a few more. So this is, you know, Russia and Ukraine are very uh, significant destinations in the acquiring of land. And they have uh, 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 regimes, legal regimes, it is not easy for a foreign actor to buy land in Russia and Ukraine or any of the other countries that are the former Soviet Union because they have very, the way they construct jurisdiction is actually quite, uh, quite complicated, quite thick. Here is more, so there is Morgan Stanley, et cetera. Though that deal it may have fallen through, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm hoping that you're sort of reading quickly through that. And here are some... Figures. I hope that you can that you can see this, but um, let me see where this is. So this is Africa. Africa is the main destination. I should say that you see two measures here. I don't know that we want to get into too much detail, but the white columns are where we know the seller and the buyer. And this is a massive effort, by the way. This is not my data. A massive effort of all many of us who are working on this. The yellow one is where we only know who sold. We don't know who bought. But one kind of buyer who does not have to list what they buy are hedge funds. When, when Goldman Sachs buys land, they actually have to put it in the public domain because they have a kind of a, you know, they represent other investors. Hedge funds, they don't have to do that. So that is why a, a lot of the people who are checking this out are thinking that hedge funds are really a far more significant buyer in all of this. Now, again, hedge fund means really financializing land. So it is yet another element. And so this is for the world, so the 200 million plus. Uh, so I'm just going to move on. And here, the yellow, this is something that most people are not aware of. The yellow is industrial crops. 
So most of the land that is being acquired by foreigners is not for food. And, and, and this carries implications because in Brazil, for instance, if you, if you move from black beans to uh, soy or palm, uh, you are creating poverty. You are not just throwing them off the land. You are actually creating poverty and hunger because you cannot eat soy. If you grow black beans, you know, you can at least eat them. So the, the you know, food is a, is a much smaller portion than these industrial crops. That is really what is altering the setup for a lot of people. So there are enormous consequences. And again, one of the consequences is the growth of population in cities. Now here, sort of as just a, a sort of a wrap up of this particular section, you know, this shift from national territory to global commodity, jurisdiction, et cetera. And, and for me, what we see here is a repositioning of territory in the global division of functions, right? It becomes actually productive land, if you want, productive of certain things. But the territorial aspect is really affected by this. Secondly, the making of alternative jurisdictions, you know, going beyond all the forms of extraterritoriality. Some, some people will argue that what we're looking at is the making of all kinds of extraterritorialities. But for me, there is something else that is happening as well. South Korea and Sweden are both signatories to the International Criminal Court. They both have acquired land from the, the president of Sudan. The president of Sudan is under a mandate, arrest mandate, you know this, right, from the International Criminal Court. So on the one hand, a country like Sweden, nice country, Sweden, South Korea, you know, they are signatories of something that the United States is not. On the other hand, they are transacting. So, so these are sort of what you see when you look at this in the details. You see all these alternative geopolitics in the making. And um, I, can't, I can't see it. Right. And so, and the other one is really the making of these parallel geopolitical circuits. You know, when China buys all that land or whatever. What are we seeing? By the way, the, the, the biggest buyers are firms. It's not necessarily governments. They are, we have hundreds of firms who are buying land for all kinds of reasons. Um, now, here, what I want to, what I want to get at is what I think of as if you want the steam engine of our epoch, which is finance, I think. It's not a great steam engine, but it's a steam engine. And so part of this, this expulsion that I'm talking about, you know, what, what happens at the edge, has to do with finance. It has to do with many things. The land grabs, you know, it's not necessarily finance, but I want to talk about finance. So this, to me, some of you must be familiar with this graph, right? This is a business school. So this is credit default swaps. I assume I don't have to. Sold as an insurance, but they're not an insurance. They're a derivative. So this, to me, captures what I want to say about finance. One can say a lot of things. I just want to say one thing. Finance is not about money. Finance is a capability. And so from 201 to 207, you see a growth from under a trillion to 62 trillion. Think of any economic sector that has that growth rate. It's very rare. It's so huge. Now, 62 trillion at its high point, and then it started to lose a bit, uh, is more than global GDP at that time. I'm sure that some of you know this, right? Global GDP was 54 trillion. Now, this also represents finance because you have both perspectives. Those who think, remember this, it's really a short and brutal history, right? From 201 to 208, that's a very short history. Those who think this system has life in it, it's still going to go on. And those who are worried, who think, remember the discussions in the early 2000s, think, no, 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 this is ending. And so they want, the ones who really believe this is going to keep on growing design an instrument that they sell as an insurance. And the others buy it. So what happens in 2007 when you see this first fall, and then it happens even more in, in 2008? Those who have decided, okay, the system is going nowhere, this is 2007 up there, say, okay, I'm cashing in my insurance. But the money wasn't there. 
because the crisis had in fact begun to eat up. And then you have a kind of a collapse. And in fact, $50 trillion, sort of, which is almost the global GDP, disappear. I was telling my students in class, I said, well, 50 trillion are gone. And they asked, who got it? Nobody got it. And that is why finance needs to be understood as a capability rather than, you know, just money. Now, uh, what, what I want to, to cover now are a few short, brutal histories where finance is actually the steam engine that makes that possible. Now, I'll, I also want to, to make a, 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 a footnote. I think we need finance because finance makes capital. Traditional banking also makes capital, but it, goes, it moves very slowly. The problem with finance is that if you don't capture it, you know, once it reaches a certain level and you bring it down and you materialize it into a, a green transport system, social housing, whatever, you know, it goes on the other side of the curve and it becomes a destructive force. And I think that is what we have uh, lived with a bit. So, so I just want to give the example, some of you are familiar with this, I'm sure, of how destructive finance can be with those who are absolutely not connected to the high finance circuit. One thing is those financiers who put in investment then want to cash in and there is no money and they lose. But another thing is, as I say here, when modest neighborhoods become part of global finance. And this is a very good example that shows this, this combination of complexity, enormous complexity, and elementary brutalities as an outcome. So, so I, I, I'm, this is a, an American case, but then I'm going to show you some data. This is spreading. To, because the instrument is such, it's a financial project, we call it sub, they call it subprime mortgage, but it's not a state project. Huh? It's not the state uh, trying to develop an instrument that allows modest income people to buy a house. You know, this is how it starts in the United States. It was a very decent and reasonable project. This is a financial project. And so it's radically different. So I don't know how much people know about this, but I'm, let me just uh, give you the figures. So these are foreclosures. Now, you know that a foreclosure is a, is a notice. Eh? It doesn't mean that you're out. But in the meantime, and again, a very short history eh? from really, it starts in 201, but this is when it really takes off, 206 to 2010, 2011. It's, it's the, the worst years have been the last two years. And, and, um, and in the end, we now have over 9 million households thrown out of their homes. Now, a household can be one person, can be two, can be three. We're talking about 30 million people. It doesn't mean that they're homeless, by the way. Huh? There are homeless people living in tent cities, and there are homeless people living in the desert, you know, slap cities, as they call it. But we also have people going to, you know, to poorer housing or whatever, so they're not all homeless. But 30 million people. Now, I want to make that a Pythagorean number, though I don't need to do that in Singapore because you are 4 million. So you know what 30 million means. But I, when I speak to countries that have very large, like the United States, so it's like I'm Dutch. My country has 16 million people. So it's like some voice says, all of you who are on the Dutch territory out, and then you do it again. Now, the second point, this is invisible. This is an invisible tragedy. In the same way that those expelled from the Greek shrunken economic space, they become sort of invisible. Now we still remember, but eventually they become invisible. How is this process? Many people don't know this. They just don't know it. The, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, just announced that another six million foreclosures are happening, like in the last, you know, starting a year ago and, and the cycle ends in 2014, because these are contracts that were designed, you know, to end in 2014. Another short, brutal history. Now, what I want to emphasize here, what I want to pull out is the invisibility. How is it possible that this massive process is invisible? And those are sort of the elementary dynamics of a system. So we have whole neighborhoods, some of you must have seen the images, that are empty. The houses are standing there, but they're empty. Well, you know what? Your average person is not going to have any reason to go to that empty neighborhood because there's nobody living there. 
we have thousands and thousands living in tent cities. And the tents are like the, you know, the international humanitarian system, little, very neat little tents. And they are provided by municipal governments throughout the United States, and there are thousands and thousands living in them. Well, you know, nobody really goes visit there. So it's invisible. It's in its materiality is fully there, but it is absolutely invisible. And um, uh, uh, and I have I show this video to my students sometimes. It is about one of these tent cities. And out of the tent, and again, these tents are very neat little tents. Huh? They're not like shanty town tents. And this person comes out, and he's blonde, white. In other words, not minority or whatever and a minoritized minority, uh, and he's dressed with one of these brand, you know, what do you call Lacoste or whatever, which have the crocodile or whatever it is, and khaki pants, in other words, like, a, you know, a middle class, whatever. And he's very well taken care of. He crawls out of his little tent, because the tents are little, hmm? and, uh, and he starts to speak, and, uh, and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that I will get a job. And literally, this person is waiting to be called back into the system. But that's the other half of the story. You know? And then you compare that with a slum in the global south, like think of the slums in Indian cities, where those people, as soon as they arrive to the slum, you know, they start making their houses, making a sub-economy. So the tragedy, and we pick that up in Greece and in Spain as well, right? The tragedy is that when you are expelled from the system, you don't have the instruments to make the social, to make, you know, in the way they have in the slums. So this is a double, this is a double tragedy that is happening. And I want to emphasize again this, this interaction between what is visible and what is invisible. A lot of what I'm talking about is deeply material. It is vast. It's enormous. It's not necessarily visible. Systemically speaking, it becomes invisible. And I think these are, I mean, to me, these seem very sort of important questions. I want to mention one thing about this, because I think that most people don't understand what, I, <clears throat> what we might mean by saying this is a financial project, it's not a state project. So the state's project of the subprime mortgages was, we'll try to get housing, we'll try to help poor people, low-income people get housing. This was about producing, making, a financial instrument that could be labeled as an asset-backed security. Now, when this story begins, like around 206, 205, as many of you, I'm sure, know, the value of financial, uh, you know, the financial value, financial assets, they call it, uh, uh, as measured by outstanding derivatives, was $630 trillion. I hope that everybody knows that figure, but anyhow, maybe not. Now, $630 trillion is over 14 times global GDP. So we're talking serious, serious making. And uh, <clears throat> so the high investment investors, you know, they are not stupid. They say, okay, sell me an instrument that has an asset that has land in it, that has something material, that is not simply a derivative on a credit rate, on a, you know, that kind of a thing. And so out comes this idea. Now, in the, this is like the United States is ground zero. In the United States, 70% of people own their house. What is left are very modest people. So the instrument that was developed, very complex instrument, you know, we're talking the mathematics of physicists. You know this, right, for finance. <clears throat> it is not <clears throat> the mathematics of microeconomics, which posits closure. You know, we're talking algorithms. They're open. What you put in, you mix it up, it's the algorithm, and puff out comes something. So, so the, the, uh, this is a footnote now. The, you know, Goldman Sachs has a, you know, the back, the back, the back room, the notion of the back room, which used to be the secretaries. Well, the back rooms now in the financial firms are full of physicists. Physicists, it's true. I find them adorable. After they are 30, they don't know what to do with themselves. So there they are, you know, and it's a technical problem. It's a technical challenge. So they come out with these incredible... Uh, I mean, this is... And, and when I say the mathematics of physicists, it's the mathematics of those who track what they cannot know. You know, 
And so finally, when I say finance is a capability, if you want traditional banking sells money it has, finance sells something it does not have. And in that not having then lies its creativity and lies its need to invade other sectors, financialize them. Because really, just the notion that finance is about money is just simply a mistake. That's why those 50 trillion that I was describing before, you know, poof, they were gone. It's not about money, it's a capability. And it needs to invade other economic sectors. So um, this 30% that were left in the United States, and probably it's more like 20%, they were, they were prime targets. Now the challenge, what was the, cha what was the technical problem that the physicists had to solve? How do you delink the value to the high investment circuit from the actual value of whatever the monthly mortgage is or the value of the actual asset. The challenge was that it all starts with the contract, a contract that represents a material asset. This is really creative, you understand? This is a very challenging issue. And so what, what, what they needed, and then there is, a, there is a, an intersection of time and numbers. <clears throat> so for the thing to work, given you know, the, the speed with which these finance functions, you needed 500 contracts in a week to make it work. So 15 million contracts were basically extended in a period of five years. That's a short, brutal history. It's like that credit default swaps. And that is why we have all these foreclosures. They, all they wanted was the contract. It's like killing somebody to get corneas for the, you know, corneas and the let, you don't even take all the things that you could use, you know, so, so just the contract. Municipal government budgets went down. People lost everything they had. You know. I mean, it's extraordinary. The contract represented an asset. It was mixed up with other you know, valuable high-grade debt, etc. And then, But they overdid it. What I was saying at the beginning, you know, finance is not so good at governing itself. So they overdid it, so they wind up with a catastrophic situation, etc., also for finance. Now, final item that I want to add here is that when you look at the at the short history that comes after 2006, you see that uh, government, global, global GDP went from 54 trillion to about 45 trillion, you know, by 2011, 2012. Finance went from 630 trillion, a little bit of a dip, and now, I'm sure you know this, quadrillion plus. Now you understand, this is not money, huh? We, we give it a monetary, but that is a capability. That is what I mean by a capability. So when you look at these charts, you see that all our governments have become poorer. The Western European governments, you know, et cetera, the, the United States, they could not do the infrastructure projects that they were able to do, you know, in the 60s. And finance has, yes, there was a sharp dip, and, and then it went on, and now it's over a quadrillion. I, I don't know, I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about. Now, I want to just, and these are clearly, I'm talking expulsions here. Now, oops, now I want to just show you the global spread of this. So look at this gray zone, this gray triangle as a potential. Huh? So here we're talking, so why bother with Singapore? You already have such a high rate of, of residential, you know, either ownership or mortgage, etc. But look at India, China, enormous potential. This instrument, you understand what it means. You can sell a mortgage because it doesn't matter what the household can or cannot do. All you need is the contract, and in the meantime, then you let. I mean, the, the bleeding is enormous. So those, those, uh, you know, those nine million households in the United States. I mean, that is serious stuff. And then you look here. Same thing in in Europe. By the way, it's just Slovenia here. It's not that Eastern Europe just invented a new country. That is Slovenia. I mean. It, but then I, I just want to, here I just want you to look at a few figures. So this, look at, because this is also part of the story. Look at this title, right? Ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. Now, credit sounds great. Credit is debt. They sell you money that you can spend. And it's credit, you expect it, but it is debt. Now, again, a short, brutal history. 2000 to 2005, let's take Hungary, which now has a million foreclosures. Just those foreclosures that I was talking about, a million. Hungary, that's a lot in Hungary. So Hungary went from having 11% of household debt 
vis-a-vis -vis disposable income of the household to almost 40%. Can people see the numbers here? Okay. And if you take, you know, all of these countries had pretty sharp uh, increases. Now, the United States, of course, in 2000 was already at over 100%. Huh? You know that. And by 2005, it was 132%. Uh, look at Germany. 70, 70, 70, 70. I mean, the Germans, I don't know how they do it, but, you know. And that's a very reasonable level of debt. But anyhow, this, this goes. And so then when I look at this kind of stuff, then I say, who owns this debt? This household debt. Because, you know, if a little local bank owns your household debt, that little bank, even if the owner is a creep, it doesn't matter. The owner of that little bank needs the community, needs the households and the little firms. So the notion is that the interest is going to recirculate in the community. So here are the results. Did I have that right? Yeah. So look at Hungary again. 40% of Hungary's household debt is owned by foreign banks. That's not good. And again, as I was saying, 50, 50, uh, uh, a million households have, have, are under foreclosure and have been basically thrown out of their houses in, in Hungary. These, these are all histories, very compressed histories. 360,000 in Latvia, 470,000 in Spain. I can't remember it, but 250,000 in, uh, in Ireland. This is like, you know, and, and those gray triangles that I showed are of course, also subject to this. Now, I add in the story, I hope you have already read it, all kinds of other things that I don't want to dwell on now. I just want to, um, at the other end, we have the super prime, super, it has nothing to do with subprime, huh? super prime housing market, which is, this is like almost ethnographic entertainment, I should say. So this is a minimum price. So in Monaco, if, if, and these, these are global markets, you understand, very selective, very few uh, numbers actually, but huge. These are minimum prices. So if, if, a, if a, somebody wants to sell some, a house, these are houses, not corporate offices, houses, wants to sell a house in a super prime market, which is a very specialized market, uh, you're at least the, the minimum price. Now, the top price can be 100 million for a house. In New York City, for instance, an apartment, a luxury apartment that is part of this market, sold for 100 million, an apartment in Manhattan. So anyhow, and then we have the dominant nationalities. In Monaco, 100% of the owners of houses in Super Prima are foreigners. In London, 80%. And these are the dominant nationalities. Now, I'm just running through this. So London, New York is positively cheap, you could say. But look how many different nationalities. The, the groups of nationalities vary enormously also. These are all kinds of pregnant geographies, you know, in there. Or contra Here is Dubai, and Dubai is cheaper than the others. You see, and look at the nationalities are quite different. Paris, and then Singapore, not so expensive. But again, that's the minimum price. You know, if you're beneath that, you're not in this market. You're not, you don't have the privileges. And look at this one. Shanghai, 6.4 million. Uh, and the nationalities, Hong Kong, Taiwan, US, Canada, Korean, Singapore, and Australia, I mean, all the world. Hong Kong, 15.4 million. Who are the main buyers? Mainland Chinese. I don't know. I find that rather cu curious, so to speak. Now, this to me is a graph that captures uh, you know, from one particular angle, some of what I've been talking about. And this is the United States, which to me always is a, sort of a good exhibit, number one, because it is pretty extreme. It's very brutal, the United States. I mean, Singapore is far more civilized, you know, in some of these dimensions. So this goes from 1917 to 205. Actually, you can continue it to the, to the later census, 209. This shows the income share of the top 10% of earners. 10% 10 10 of earners have other sources of income capital gains, inherited wealth, but we don't include that. And so in, in, uh, in the early, you know, early 1900s, it was up to 47%. Look at the sharp drop. It's still a robust share, but it's, you know, 32, 33. 1987, it goes up again. And this are, are of course, sort of the so-called Keynesian years. You know, it's a bit of problematic to call it that, but for shorthand. And, and this graph doesn't show it, but it implies it that something happens here where you have the growth of a middle class. When you read the literature of this period, here is the notion. The notion is we have discovered the formula to have a growing middle class, a growing prosperous working class, et cetera, et cetera. We are never going to go back. Well, 1987, 
you know, we have now. And so, so just to give you, um, well, here's another graph that I have. Look at the, so this is 1979. This is United States census. So for income, you know, you, you take the full year before the census. So this 1980, if you want to, and again, this goes back to 2009. And what you see is that the top 1% got, uh, uh, saw a growth of 281% in their income. Again, that excludes all the other sources. The bottom, uh, 40%, so almost no increase. Now, the visual order that communicated, so to speak, what is happening in cities was one of redevelopment, growth, uh, you know, upgrading of everything you know, in cities. That told the tale. And it took, uh, I mean, I was already in, you know, in, in the, here in this period saying, this is not good, it's not good what's happening. And everybody was saying, oh, growth. Because the visual order, what we saw, what was visible, was this whole rebuilding of cities. Now, I don't know if people know, but say, you know, London was broke in the 1970s. Uh, New York was broke in the 1970s. In a lot of these cities, so there was a sense of, and then when the rebuilding begins, gentrification is one term for it, etc. you know, the sense was, my God, all of this stuff that is happening. And in fact, <clears throat> a very good share of the population, so no increase. And this is invisible. This was invisible throughout these years. And again, as you can see, I'm really sort of in the, in the shadow of, so to speak, right? Uh, powerful categories. Now, I want to conclude by, uh, by talking about a kind of expulsion that is happening. It's a bit more intermediated, more complicated uh, to, to develop, but I'll just be brutal. And so among the unstable meanings, the meaning of, <coughs> of membership. And um, uh, we have a massive surveillance. I don't know, I just wrote for Al Jazeera a little piece that is, they give it a title, uh, Drones over there, total surveillance over here. You know, I don't know that that was a title that I would have chosen, but anyhow. So anyhow, but there is a lot of data. Washington Post used 12 of its top journalists, gave them a year to do research on surveillance. They published it. Like this is one of the things that they published is this map. Now, I don't know what you can see here. This is what we know. We don't know what we don't know, you know, that kind of uh, dilemma. So this is 10,000 plus buildings. In other words, massive material structures uh, engaged in round the clock, year round, total surveillance. This is not about traffic and all of that, eh? your speed, no, no, no. And you know that almost nobody that I talk with, because I sometimes I, in the United States saw this, these, the series of articles that the Washington Post did. I'm talking about students at Columbia University. They're meant to be. Now, I want to make a footnote. I don't know if any of you know these two experiments that were done. And this is really about what we see, even and what we don't see, even if it's there in front of us. So one is, is scient doctors who are using MRIs. You know what I'm talking about, right, MRIs? And the other one is about athletes in, in group sports, but top level athletes, and they are given these images that describe what they are doing. So when we look at MRIs, you know, because it's a complicated movement. We have now discovered, by the way, that the intelligence of uh, athletes that play in group sports, top athletes, is very, very high intelligence because they immediately sort of get it. And so these two people, very focused, and in the middle, the experimenters planted a black gorilla. <laughs> Neither the doctors looking at the MRIs nor the athletes tracking, saw the gorillas. <laughs> now, you know, and the same thing. So the Washington Post publishes these amazing maps. People didn't see it. And, and I find this extraordinary. I mean, again, I'm, this whole notion in the shadow of and what is visible and what is invisible. But anyhow, back to this. The logic of this system, well, it employs, you know, you saw the former slide maybe. There are a lot of people here employed, you know. And, um, and the logic of the system is, that for our security, we the citizens uh, have to be surveyed. You know, the country has to be surveyed to see detect the five terrorists that might be doing something bad. So a whole population, and the experts. This is not my data. Huh? The experts say that 90% of people who reside in the United States 
are under total surveillance. Now, what's the logic? The logic is that in order to secure the citizens' security, I'm saying citizens, you know, but it really means everybody who's in the territory, security, we all have to be suspect. But secondly, it also means that you have an incredible superstructure. They're collecting all this data. And if something suspicious happens, then they know that they have the archives, so to say. Now, you understand the logic. I don't know. The only beneficiaries, I think, are those who are selling all this stuff, you know, all the machinery, because uh, this is like a whole country. And this is German. I'm looking at the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, and the US. And this is, this is the new mode. So it is really drones over there and surveillance over here. And, and to, to subject a whole nation to this kind of surveillance in order to detect the possibly three, four, five who might be trouble, you know, it is a very peculiar logic. Now, I think what this does in the long run, it really evicts us partly. There is a kind of expulsion from the whole notion of membership we the citizens, and from constitutive membership. We may still be members, but we're not constitutive. We're just downgraded to something. Now, I'm not complaining about we the citizens. No, no, it's just people, really. I'm talking about us as subjects, thinking subjects, constitutive members of whatever the community. So to me, this is also a form of expulsion. You know, and you know, I have a whole other rap that I do around that. So I'm just, um, I'm just going to, to uh, end up and, and, and say that I'm trying to bring in geography, Marie Laure. So what, <laughs> what I'm really talking is about geographies within geographies, that the notion of national territory, whether you're looking at land grabs or you're looking at all the surveillance of citizens, these are structural holes in the tissue of national sovereign territory, in the tissue ends of membership, of you know, smallholder agriculture, whatever. And so the, the, what, what for me, the, the, the image of geography is not geographos. This is a geography that has what in olden times they would call terra nullius, terra nullius, the maps, you know, what you didn't know just was a blank. You flattened it into a blank. And we have a lot of terra nullius that are in the making, you know. So instead of making a geography out of it, it's just like, okay, terra nullius, huh? a lot of that. Um, and and um, and, and that is why, you know, the, the question of visibility, what is visible, what is not visible, and, and the notion of before method. I cannot just throw myself into an inquiry and subject myself to the discipline of methods that imply certain assumptions, etc. I don't want to. And so the freedom to discover, you know, to actually see. So um, the, the, the only thought about geographies is that these are geographies within geographies. I prefer the language of informal jurisdictions. You know, a jurisdiction is a system of authority. And so when China buys 3.8 million or 2.8 million hectares, it implements a kind of a system of authority. A plantation is a system of authority over vis-a-vis -vis the smallholder agriculture and et cetera. And the same thing with the surveillance apparatus. Um, Anyhow, I leave you with those thoughts. I'm not very happy. I'm a very cheery person. You can tell that I'm smiling, but it is really a very bad story. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Patrick, I'd like to share my, my personal view on uh, your presentation. Okay. The first is regarding uh, the shortcomings in the policy makings in terms of diversity and relevancy. Okay. Relevancy in terms of what I see why in the West, uh, currently the Spain is such a high unemployment rates. Okay, so actually uh, rep, uh, advanced capitalism. <coughs> but in terms of relevancy of the training and the policy making, okay, let's say the technopreneur and entrepreneurship spirit in cultivating the young graduates from in the West universities, graduate from the Western universities. Are you universities. talking about, yeah, about uh, Singapore currently, now? Yeah, <coughs> currently in Spain or certain uh, European countries, oh, okay. very high unemployment rate. Okay. Uh, there are two ways what I personally perceive. Okay. Uh, in terms of policy making, um, the government may lack of this entrepreneur and technopreneur spirit in uh, cultivating a diversity, relevancy and diversity of the graduate to match the policy making. Okay. For example, you also quote, quote the China, the China case, 
like foreign or FDI from China or whatever. Okay, so let's say for FDI investment from China or whatever. Okay, they may come in, but in terms of a policy and the flexibility in exercising or uh, this land acquisition, let's say you you want to uh, distribute how much land and the type of industrial, you must set certain restriction to foreign FDI. Okay, why that's okay? Let's say when your local industry already have quite saturation in certain area. Let's say, for example, I quote an example is okay in Malaysia. For example, the durians, the XO durian, D24, uh, mountain cat, so many types of durians. Okay, in the crops cultivation in the West, what I see is, do we have more diversity in terms of are there apple grapes wine, or just a grapes wine in itself? Because the lack of diversity in terms of this a new creation of the diversity in terms uh, of the crops. Uh, uh, can you can you help me? Yeah. Because you're taking a lot of stuff, and each time you mention something, I, a I whole need to world I will come, Okay, I'll come back. I'll come back. Okay. So, so is that the help me just okay. find the particular? Okay. But so in terms of diversity and relevancy in the policy making, in terms of whether the government in terms comes to planning and policy yeah. making for foreigners FDI, is there such a gap that could not be filled properly so that this uh, it results in such a high unemployment rate? I just quote example because uh, thanks. I'll short, I'll short, I'll cut short. Thanks. Do I want to sit down? Yeah, uh, we've been standing for some time. Oh no, no, no! I sit too much. <laughs> I've talked the whole day, so it is, I'm now enjoying listening. So for my, as far as I'm concerned, you could have gone on talking, huh? but I'm just trying. But I, I, um, are you asking something about policy? What's the proper policy? Okay. Well, you know that's a good question. Uh, I don't think that our conventional instruments for policy making are going to help us here. Because it's a fiction. You know, when I was going to the, to the territory slide and, you know, the, I mean, so we are seeing the making of new jurisdictions. Territory it has become nomadic. And we're, this is absolutely a disaster from many, many different perspectives. But our conventional instruments, it's not a question of, you know, a sovereign government designing the proper policy. We, we have to find, there it has to be some sort of making of an intermediate space uh, that produces a different set of logics. For instance, uh, eliminating smallholder agriculture, trans, uh, replacing it with uh, uh, palm, means you're generating hunger. So it's not against China, it's not against, no. It's, do we want to feed our population? We can't do that. You know, we have to have substantive logics rather than the world of policy. Now, I confess, I am so uninterested in policy because policy is within the box. So I am particularly disadvantaged <laughs> to give you a policy answer. Policy, it just doesn't interest me. It's absolutely epiphenomenal. And so I go at what are we talking in terms of substance? And then if you raise the question of hunger rather than China owns it, I don't care who owns it, but let smallholders grow food that they can sell and eat. You know, and if you're going to eliminate that, then you have to find something else. So to me, and, and you know, I'm also involved in some of these mining things in Tolima and Colombia, it's just amazing stuff, you know, what is happening. When you look, I mean, we are, so one of the chapters in my expulsions book is called Dead Land, Dead Water, Dead Air. And I'm tracking all these patches of dead land and dead water that we have. You know, and out of that, I want to come out with a substantive notion, okay, what do we do? Rather than, you know, this epiphenomenal world of within the box. Now, I am not a policy person, you know, so I, I really am at a disadvantage, I admit. But that is what I would say. I would say that we who have the freedom of do, doing research and interpreting and renaming and re-narrating, there is an obligation of getting at a deeper level than that level which bridges us with the houses of power and the logics of power, you know? I mean, that also matters, but I leave that to other people, you know, that I'm just not, that's not... So I'm sorry if I cannot give you more of an answer, but I think that, you know, going to the substantive uh, issues that we confront is one first step. It's not the full answer, but it's a, it's a solid ground from which to begin to answer that kind of question. Shall we collect a few questions? Because we don't have that much time. I see okay. several hands up. Um, thank you, Saskia. That was a, a 
marvelous talk with lots of interesting ideas. But as a historian, <laughs> I knew no, it. No, 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 I have a question. <laughs> yes, I have yes. A question. Um, as a historian, I'm interested, of course, in the causes of causes. And um, I mean, not to run into infinite regress, but you know, wh why has all this happened, right? Yeah. And if you look at even your own tables from the late 70s through the 80s, it's not so much a financial story, which is the result. It's really deindustrialization. It's really bricks and mortars, the movement of jobs, the impossible, the sort of, you know, you had in the late uh, 1990s, maybe the uh, tech uh, would, would pick up, you know, yeah. capital will right, always. Right. Uh, so, I mean, uh, how can you address mm -hmm. that, that cause of the cause? Well, I think it is finance. I think finance, oh, I'm sorry, I had to, I'm violating my own best, since I'm an answer. See, uh, when you look at finance as a capability, it really changes. So let's just look at the outsourcing of jobs. You know, what we call the industrialization here <laughs> became industrialization in China. So what's the law? I have actually, I have a whole section on that. And it, this is, goes to very com great complexities to produce an elementary brutality. So what does fine, why the outsourcing? What do they save? because there is a transport cost, right? But they save our cents on every hour of work, but you know it's millions of workers. Now what makes that work? What is the aim of that? Is it really profit rate? No, it's shareholder value. You see, so there is a, the, when I say that, with that, when I emphasize the financializing and the notion that it is the steam engine, you know, it is an input. It's a capability that shapes and reshapes logics. And what I have looked at a whole, because I've long been working on the whole notion of mobility of capital, you know that perhaps, but anyhow. So why does it matter for firms to outsource jobs? And it's, the logistics are complex. The, 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 the quality controls are complex. You know, all kinds, there are really added complexities. But you know what it does? It feeds straight into an optic of shareholder value. Because they say, my God, they're lowering the price of this. You know, it's, it's, it's a, there is a part of the psychology and there is a reality to it. They are actually saving money. And so when, and so that is what I would say. You see, it, we look at it as deindustrialization, but that's just, that's like a bird's, not no, a bird's eye, no, that's not the expression. In, my English fails me, but that, that's like, you know, looking at it within, so I'm standing on this patch and this is what I see. And that is why the urbanization bit. I'm sick of people thinking that urbanization somehow from, is a miracle that falls from the sky, you know? No, go deep in rural areas and you find part of the story, you know? So, and I would argue the same with that. But you know what? I, I am a bit of a savage theorist. That's my before method. No, I really mean that actually. So I throw myself because that's a way of discovering. I'm really interested in discovering, not in replicating, you know, not that kind of stuff, in discovering. And so you have to actually throw yourself into. So I really think that fi finance doesn't explain everything. And as I said, we all need a bit of finance. Eh? We need a bit of debt. But I think that it's the steam engine. And the steam engine did many good things and some very bad things, you know. So that is sort of my take on that. But again, you don't have to agree with me clearly. But uh, <laughs> we can talk about yeah, we can. important at a certain yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> right. Marx already was saying that. Um, hello, um, I come from India. My name is Gautam. Uh, my question is that yeah, uh, we, we've talked about how the on the supply side there is uh, you know greater should I say use the term new colonization of areas within Africa where countries like China and even India now are kind of getting into and, and kind of you know expanding the footprint, getting the right. land and everything. But the other side and from the Indian perspective is that yes, it is feeding so many you know hungry stomachs as well. And we are constrained with our resources back home in India. So would you consider that there's a morality after all or, or we can kind of nuance it, this discussion by saying that that aspect of land which is going into feeding people or which is going into actually agriculture alone for food is, is acceptable in a certain sense and the industrial portion is not? Is that fair to say that? Well, it's partly an empirical question, you know. I'd have to check it out a bit. But, you know, you in India have terrible hunger. 
is that food that India is growing offshore going to feed your poor? Really? I mean, you know, when you look, when you crawl into each of that, Ethiopia is a very good case, you know, a, a country that has long had hunger. So Ethiopia has made a big deal with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia grows food there for its, you know, thriving middle classes. We, the taxpayers of the world, through the food program, World Food Program, give like $200 million worth of food to Ethiopia to feed its people. Well, you understand what I'm talking about, right? So, so the, it, it really is a messy story. Now, I do think that there is no perfect solution to this. You know, we, we really have a problem. But I'm not so persuaded that, uh, that this, you know, I, it's not so much that a foreigner owns. For me, the nationality question either is actu actually neither here nor there, no, really. But it's that you, you throw out. So smallholder agriculture can be very productive. It doesn't always, eh? but you could actually incentivate that. They really pr can produce food staples. And, and then when you see what's happening in a lot of these places, that most of the crops, as you saw, it's not about food, throw in a second variable, the com not just the commodifying of food. Food has long been commodified. The financializing of the food commodity. And you know, you, there is so much of that kind of stuff happening. That, and the large-scale plantation enables that. You know, if it's all smallholder, it's very difficult to really commodify it, and it's far more difficult even to financialize it. So I don't know. You know, I don't have the answer to your question. And if you're telling me that part of the food that India is growing overseas is actually going to feed its poor, then I say, well, actually, that could be reasonable. You know, again, it's not, a, it's not about the nationality issue for me, really. You know, because those national governments are not necessarily governments that I admire. That their sovereign sovereign is a bit weak, and it's fine with me, frankly. You know, I mean, in some cases, but it's this issue of destroying productive capability. And there's quite a bit of data that suggests that smallholder agriculture is actually far more effective. It's more there is there is a, it's a more efficient way of producing food than these vast plantations, and there is not the depletion of land quality. I mean, you in China with the Green Revolution, I mean, in, in India with the Green Revolution, you have had a depletion of soil, also not the quality, the nutrients. So these are complicated. You know, I'm not an expert on this food, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that at least some of the poor in India, because that is a very dramatic story, you know, the wealth that you have. That anyhow. Yes. I had a quick question. Uh, uh, I'm also enamored by history, you know, causes of causes. Uh, I think also the greatest thriller. So you talked of shareholder value, and in the oldest, uh, a multinational corporation probably was the VOC, the Dutch East India Company. And, uh, you know, when, uh, so I recall when Juen Lai was asked, what does it think of the French Revolution? He said, it's too early to say. Yeah. So, so in terms of the Industrial Revolution <laughs> and, and the colonialism, do yeah. you think now that people, the countries who have gotten on the path of industrial capitalism, they have, they don't have colonies, so they are desperately searching for some, those who can, are using them, those who cannot are actually colonizing themselves. So in terms of broad picture, again, of history and time periods, do you think that the motion that was set in in the, in the 1600s, we are actually right on the trajectory of? Well, you know, this is, a, this is a debate. When I talk to certain audiences about this, they always bring in the historical question. And, and one version of that, if they are Marxists, they will say, it's just just the commodifying of you know of land, and and it's true. Uh, and then if there are historians, they often might have this kind of comment. You know, these are long, deep histories, and and it's not like there is. I am sort of interested in in capturing this combination of complexity. You know, so for me, this when you look at these contracts, you don't know the hoops and loops they have to go through. And so I'm just interested in the waste. <laughs> you know, so it's it's not just about the end result, you know what I mean? And so from my perspective, it does not help me 
to mark the specificity of the current period, if I say, you know, this is the same old stuff. Yes, of course, on some level, I wrote it there on one of these slides. It is commodification, but it's also... So I'm interested in understanding informal jurisdictions, you know. The, 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 so, so um, and this, what you mentioned, you know, when territory exits, these conventional... So it, it, these are also empirical uh, cases that illuminate other questions, you know. I, I really think that that the ground is shifting and it's very difficult to capture that because you know when people think that globalization that they situate the action you know whatever the change on what happens with borders i think that is such a mistake you know borders not much happens sure we have deregulated a bit re-regulated some other and this notion that you know a lot of the globalization scholars they they look at the border and for me, the border is not where most of the action is happening. Most of the action is happening in the interiority of the national. And then you have a complex engagement, you see, between one type of jurisdiction, sovereign, etc., and other, and jurisdictions, again, systems of authority, right? And, and that is really what I'm interested in. So, so for me, it doesn't help me to link it, you know, to the, that I don't deny those older histories. I think one, it depends on what question one has, you know, right? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Anne Brooks, I'm a senior visiting fellow at ARI at NUS. This is a question about you, Saskia. Oh. Uh, no, I, I think this is a very important question uh, because I see that you are on a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. And I watched Bloomberg last night and saw Richard Haas also. Oh. Uh, and, and, and I was appalled by what he had to say. He's terrible. Yes, he is terrible. But the question I is... I detest him. Uh, well, uh, I mean, it's interesting. I haven't seen him speak before, but he was appalling uh, and yeah. presented a very, very negative view right. of uh, the US in terms of foreign relations, I have to say. Right. Anyhow, this is a question about, about you. Yeah. Uh, you're obviously, as we all know, a public intellectual beyond a scholar in terms of um, um, policy, despite the fact that... Politics. You Yes, so when can we see you move into politics in the US? I, as you know, have just returned from Berkeley, and there's Robert Reich, there's Christina Romer, all are um, excellent scholars, but have also served in Clinton and Obama administrations. So when can we see Saskia, please, in no American politics? I would not fit for a minute. I'm really, in, I'm not disciplined in that sense. I'm, undisciplined, which leads me to another kind of discipline. But I want to come back to the Council on Foreign Relations. So I've been a member of that council for a very long time. When I first started, so I knew why I accepted. I was invited to join. You know, you don't apply for that. You are invited to join, basically. And so I used it for two things. Now, that was time one when I was still in New York before I went to University of Chicago. And so my first project, and it became one of the most successful projects, and my, my ally was Peggy Dulaney, the daughter of David Rockefeller, who is an activist, you know, et cetera. So we were, we, were, we were friends. And so I said, okay, we're going to bring, and this was, this is, was in, the, in the 1980s, and we're going to bring the Bronx into the Council on Foreign Relations. I had everybody. Richard Holbrook, Kissinger. And it was an extraordinary event. And really, I said, you know, if we're going to talk about New York and what is happening with New York, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to bring other constituencies. And they came. And they produced a book that was one of the most successful books that they have had. Now, then, frankly, the, there is another tactic that I use. Every year, I recommend, a, you know, they have these junior scholars that they bring in. You don't have to be young, but it's, a, you know, you're just sort of a whatever for one or two years. And I, every year, I, I nominate somebody. I don't always get them in, you know, because every year. But so I get the other voices. Now, third point, a very American story. You have a leadership that is totally regressive, because it really is. And then you have all these other worlds inside that institution. You know, it's full of researchers who do excellent work. So, so I, you know, because I'm a member, etc. You know, I, I can see also the inside, but I barely go to these to these. I go to certain events. You know, they have a lot of also like the World Economic Forum. They have a lot of sort of radical person. You know, it's, it's sort of a mode. It's not serious. 
but um, but I I certainly push you know that kind of thing. I don't know. But no, I'm politics. I I, I am so I I would just lose my temper so quickly. I can't stand. I mean, Obama, my God, he would be a great Supreme Court judge. <laughs> Deliberation, but not action. You know, in politics, it really is a question also of action, I think, you know? But anyhow, the, I find this, I have not been asked this question very often, and I must say, so thank you. <laughs> but, right. All right. I would maybe... Can yes, I have the privilege absolutely. of one question? <laughs> uh, I would like to come back to the notion of systemic age because I like it a lot. Uh, and uh, and I, I like the idea, in a sense, in, in your talk that we can feel that, you know, going back a bit to the history question and the cause question and the fact that we might be actually in, in a kind of shifting ground moment and situation uh, when you tell us that actually at, until a certain point in history, and we see that very well on the graphs, uh, when you're on the systemic edge, uh, basically the, 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 the solution is really integration in the system. And after a certain period of time, the solution is expulsion. And with that, we go into this. Uh, and, and then if we listen to all the rest of the talk, we see that it's expulsion after expulsion after expulsion, which kind of leads, obviously, to the situation, the kind of surprising situation that at some point the system is empty or, or nearly empty. So, uh, so, so, you know... Where? <laughs> What's next? No, I have next? thought about that. Absolutely. <laughs> but no, no, absolutely. But you see, I, I, what I'm talking about, I said it at the beginning in passing, but maybe not clearly enough. I'm really interested in extreme conditions. And the extreme condition is typically not a majority condition. It doesn't have to be typically. So what I'm talking I, I, and, and, and the assumption is that the extreme condition is heuristic under certain conditions, not always. And I think that it is with a complex system. So what I'm so the systemic edge, my point of inquiry is the systemic edge. So I see that traffic in, out, in, out, etc. Right? And um, but I am very in for instance, I'm tracking in Greece and Spain, and I answered this, I said this in an, in an interview in the newspaper, and that created a whole. So I said, you know what? I think people should go back. You know, there are a lot of abandoned rural villages in Spain and in Greece. Uh, and I, about two years or three years ago, I said, you know, they, they should go back, occupy, start, make an economy, you know? And you know, this is really happening. I'm not saying because I said it, but when I said it, it got picked up and, you know, Sasson has become anti-urban. I mean, you don't know, you know, this sort of becomes a ridiculous discussion. But really what is happening is that in Greece and in Spain, they are going back to what is abandoned land. They are fixing old structures, you know, and I think that is interesting. And so for me, what I didn't say here is, you know, a critical question is the question of making for me, as I said. And so I, I, one question I have is who makes the social today? We're very good at making certain things, but the social... The middle classes, we do not know how to make the social. We consume. We consume our citizenship. We consume. And so when you think about, when I think about sort of a very quick, dirty answer, uh, there are two actors who make the social. And they make the social because they have to. One is elites. It's not the same to be an elite and all the additional powers than it is to be just a collection of rich people. And the other one is people who are, uh, you know, in, in different kinds of situations, like slum dwellers, you know, the certain kinds of poor neighborhoods in Latin America. I grew up in Latin America. They still know how to make the social. Or immigrant communities in the global north, they collectivize the survival project, and in that, you know, and they develop certain capabilities. So along those lines, and I crawl into possible scenarios of what that would mean, you know, if more and more people are expelled, I mean, Greece is really extreme. I mean, I don't know if people know, but people are leaving, families are leaving their children because they don't have a place to live with in churches, and in, you know, it's extreme. At some point, it's not that the majority, because the majority is still inside huh, the system. I'm really talking about extreme conditions. All of these are extreme conditions. So, but I think that sort of the notion of making, like, and so you look at, uh, I'm interrupting myself, I know, urban farming, you know, so New York City on its website now proudly says we have 112 farms. Well, you know, it sounds cute, etc., but actually it's real work, and, it's, and some of these farms are now providing restaurants, and restaurants are, 
are selling seasonally. Real food. Real food, rather than imported tomatoes from the Netherlands, which are tasteless, you know, why bother to eat those tomatoes, you know? And so, sort of, it's this creeping, but I'm not saying that this is the revolution, it is not. But it is the making of alternative spaces that are only partially alternative, I just don't even say alternative, but you know, spaces of production, spaces of making. What the solution is to this situation we're in, I don't know that. I would not pretend to know. But, uh, yeah. So I think um, we're done, aren't we? Yeah. Thank, you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>